Hello, Unwrappers. Ollie Mann here. I want you to imagine a simple Venn diagram. That's two circles slightly overlapping. In the first circle, there's you, the listener of The Week Unwrapped. You're the only one that matters to me. Hi. In the other circle, it says, subscriber to six editions of The Week magazine for a pound. And in the bit where they overlap, it reads, free moleskin notebook. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that to get six issues for a pound and a free moleskin notebook branded with The Week, go to theweek.co.uk slash offer and enter the promo code podcast. Thank you. And now on with the show. It's the week ending Saturday the 13th of April, and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen Brexit being delayed again, this time until October. Nearly one billion Indians voting in their general election, and Julian Assange arrested by police outside the Ecuadorian embassy. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team are the boss man Holden Frith, deputy boss man Aaron McNichol, and from the official offices of The Week Junior, its editor Felicity Capon. She always looks at me with hostility with these introductions. <laughs> Producer Matt writes them. I don't understand why. Uh, starting the show this week is Holden. Uh, what do you think this week should be remembered for? How religious fundamentalism and sexuality make strange bedfellows. One of the most peculiar issues with the uh, Iranian, uh, current Iranian society is the strict uh, sanctioning of uh, transgender reassignment surgery by the uh, Islamic regime. And uh, this seems very odd for most people because uh, in an Islamic country you would assume that they would be against uh, transgenderism. But the truth is in the Islamic Republic, uh, for whatever reason, they approved uh, sex uh, reassignment surgery in the mid-1980s. YouTube channel Iran Talk there, discussing the short history of transgender rights in Iran. Holden, since the 1980s, gender reassignment in Iran, not what many of us would expect from an ultra-conservative country. No, and in fact, um, Iran carries out more gender reassignment surgery than any other country except Thailand. What's less surprising, perhaps, is that this isn't any great project in liberal self-actualization. It's actually a quirk of Iranian religious law combined with extreme homophobia. Explain. Immediately after the Islamic Revolution in 1979, transgenderism was illegal as you might expect. Barely discussed, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it was, I think it was just sort of categorised as a sexual deviancy and then left at that. Uh, what brought about this change was actually a slightly strange meeting engineered by an activist with Ayatollah Khamenei, and she managed to persuade him that trans people were not sexual deviants, but actually were people suffering from a medical condition mm -hmm. and a medical condition that could be fixed. By having gender reassignment surgery. By having gender reassignment surgery. Since then, the amount of this surgery does seem to have increased steadily over the years. And that seems to be partly because of a huge pressure on gay Iranians to identify not as homosexual, but as transgender. I see. OK, so homosexuality is, as we all know, illegal in Iran. Not only illegal, but punishable by death for men. And unlike the few other countries which have capital punishment, Iran does actually act on it and executes people on a fairly regular, regular basis. So the only way out, if you like, it, it, rather than just living in the closet for all of your life, is to say, well, I, I, I'm sexually attracted to people of my own gender, therefore I must be transgender, even if you're not. Yes, and it seems, you know, you would expect that the closet would be the most obvious answer to this, and I'm sure for a lot of people it is. But what I think is the really surprising aspect of this story is that there's a state-funded and sponsored program of gender reassignment surgery, and it's actually permissible for Iranian state media to talk about transgender identity in a way that they can't talk about homosexuality. Well, you always surprise me, Holden. Uh, <laughs> I didn't expect we'd be talking about this. I've learnt things. Have you, Felicity? Have you ever encountered this I have. story before? No, I haven't. I think it's a very surprising story, but also one that's deeply tragic. I think ostensibly I was quite shocked to learn that Iran is the only Muslim country in the Persian Gulf region that gives trans citizens the right to have their gender identity recognised by the law and also the idea that 
the Islamic Republic of Iran to some degree actually subsidizes it seems like a good thing but actually it's not a good thing at all and it's some of the stories that have emerged about how people are living with this are really really tragic and I think just earlier you were alluding to the idea that it's being discussed and that it's something that's spoken about and actually I don't think it is I think for a lot of people the websites uh, to do with this sort of thing are blocked in Iran there's not a lot of information there's not a lot of, a lot of discussion um, there's huge amounts of stigma for people who do undergo surgery a lot of people are still sort of subjected to huge amounts of discrimination and prejudice and the surgeries they're not performed very very well lots of them are botched and lots of um, Iranians are living with horrible deformities and that sort of thing so there's a really it's a, it's a really nasty story. And that issue, Arian, about, I guess, the education not being there, or at least there being an active miseducation for people who are gay or bisexual, essentially people growing up not knowing that's an option. Like the option is either you're mm. straight or you must be transgender. That's something that's quite disturbing as well. Definitely. I, I um, found an old podcast from the BBC uh, featuring a, a reporter who went to speak with a bunch of Iranians uh, living in Turkey who had fled because they were gay and the only options for them were to be killed or to get gender re- reassignment surgery. And the range of different tragedies that were uncovered by this reporter you know not not only the the gay people who'd had to just leave their lives and and families and homes and everything to live in a foreign country but also some people who had already undergone the surgery and were living as a trans person now but regretting it you know looking back on the their life and and realizing only subsequently that this was something that wasn't what they were feeling they were sort of driven to it and there were, and as you say there wasn't the education for them to be able to realize that uh, you know that that you can be just gay. You, you know, it, yeah, it just doesn't exist. And that comes back on onto your patch in a way, Felicity, doesn't it? Because there's been this discussion with children about education around homosexual relationships in British schools mm, now, and mm-hmm. obviously that doesn't happen in Iran. If that is lacking, which it obviously is from Iranian schools, is there something that more liberal countries might be able to assist with? I'm thinking of a sort of <laughs> gay world service, I suppose, for want of a better phrase. Possibly. I don't really know. I mean, I think with Iran, you are seeing these people who have fled to more liberal countries, setting up support networks, which are then uh, they're then getting in touch with people in Iran and having conversations about it. And there was um, one example I was reading about of um, a woman in Iran who called up a guy in Canada with questions about the surgery and he asked her if she was transsexual or whether she in fact was a lesbian and she couldn't immediately answer because no one had ever told her what lesbian meant Mm. but I think that's the scary thing I think there isn't that lack of discussion education which I think is is the main thing and the source of the confusion and tragedy and I think in Iran the the issues are particularly acute because of the extremely sharp way in which um, gender lines are drawn. So you have legally and religiously mandated dress codes, you have segregation, um, even some hairstyles are um, outlawed. In in 2015, the mullet was banned by the religious police as a homosexual hairstyle, which I think (laughs) may be a misunderstanding (laughs) as well as um, rather authoritarian way of controlling people's appearance. And this gets me to thinking, and I'm sure a lot of people listening will be feeling the same, about Brunei. Brunei's been in the news um, because uh, they have intensified their laws against homosexuality. It's now punishable by being stoned to death, and there have been protests about that uh, outside the Dorchester, for example. Uh, People want to boycott that hotel because it's owned by the Sultan. Um, But actually, something that gets a bit lost in the news about Brunei is that although clearly, you know, it's not a very pleasant ruling that they've made, no one has actually been uh, sentenced for homosexuality for some years. I mean, (laughs) it's a horrible league table but is the situation in Iran actually worse is just Brunei's getting the headlines at the moment if you are gay there yeah certainly if you look at past behavior Iran is worse the reason Brunei has attracted so much attention is because that it has made a step in the wrong direction and also because we, we you know we can't be sure that it isn't going to carry out these punishments I also think stoning has a particular graphic feel to it but it doesn't actually happen i mean it, it hasn't it, yet it hasn't yet I mean, no, i'm not, I'm not we, saying we it's hope, good we, i'm just no, saying hope, the fact it hasn't it gets lost a bit in the debate doesn't it yes but i think it's also a a question of direction of travel mm. so iran has has had these laws on the book since the islamic revolution 
and you know it didn't move from a state of liberal freedom either whereas Brunei has had more of a, a kind of unofficial don't ask don't tell policy perhaps which is not that uncommon around the world and so the fact that it has publicly said that it's going to introduce this horrific punishment has, has attracted rightly I think all of this um, attention. That said I do understand your line of question, you know, that that it's not as if Brunei is the only place where bad things are being done to gay people. And you're absolutely right. You know, 70 UN member states still criminalize same sex relations and seven United Nations member states uh, have the death penalty. So, the, you know, it's not like Brunei are alone. It's also, of course, I mean, the way, the way I just framed the question, Felicity, was kind of as if is, this is just about sex. But of course, sexuality isn't. It's about someone's whole life and their right to love someone and live with them. Yeah, and their identity. Yeah. yeah. But that, that part of the debate does get lost often doesn't it when people are even here in Britain when we were discussing homosexuality being talked about in schools Mm. it's often talked about as if what you're discussing is sex Mm. rather than love and life Mm. I think it's something that um, is is difficult for the weak junior um, in particular because we would steer away from talking about sex because our readers are too young and secondly we don't want to be seen as usurping the role of of parents in in when is the right time to talk to their children about things but I agree that when it comes to um, the idea of you know, a child at school having two mummies or a child having two daddies or, you know, that sort of thing. I think there's ways of talking about it, in, in, like you said, in terms of identity and love and respect, which has nothing to do with kind of actual sex and what's going on in the bedroom. I mean, if you published a photo of Elton John on the red carpet, would you have a caption saying Elton John and his husband, David Furnish? Yeah, and I think, you know, with Tom Daly, for example, we... we <laughs> Probably uh, more relevant to your audience. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah he is. Um, number one, we would just talk about their achievements and why they've made the headlines, firstly, but yeah, if there was a picture of, of him with his husband, then we would just sort of state it as a fact. But, you know, you don't need to go into too much detail on it. There was a really strange little parallel with another story this week in the UK. On Monday, the Times suggested that for very different reasons, um, gender identity clinics in the UK are almost going down a similar route to what's happening in Iran. I would I'd hesitate to make that connection, except that the, the language used by some of the people working in this clinic f- felt very similar. So except that, as the Times describes it, it results from a rush to accept and celebrate transgender identity rather than uh, any kind of specifically homophobic in, intent. But what, one of the... One what of, language? Well, so one of the clinicians quoted in the story said... It feels like conversion therapy for gay children. I frequently had cases where people started identifying as trans after months of horrendous bullying for being gay. And another member of staff at the clinic said, often it's homophobia within the family. Again, another quote, for some families, it's easier to say, this is a medical problem. Here's my child. Please fix them than dealing with a young gay kid. And this surprises me. And I would imagine this does not apply broadly to society, but it's, it's a particular subset. But it does seem that in some ways, um, norms of sexuality are actually more powerful than norms of gender. And if you can somehow flip somebody's gender so that you kind of preserve or manufacture a a heterosexual identity, for some people at least, that seems to be preferable. Well, particularly if you are Muslim, I presume, and, you know, you've got this ruling in Iran that Islamically that's permitted. You can imagine how in the Islamic diaspora that's something that people are going to reach for rather than homosexuality for their own children because they're going to think, well, you know, God's okay with that. I'm not sure how broadly that is adopted within Islam, actually. I think this might be a very specific Iranian ruling from from the Ayatollah. But I would say if, if you're looking for a reason, if you're looking for an excuse, if, if it happens to fit within your political pre- prejudices, then that's something you might cling to. Okay. Uh, Arian, you're up next after this. Arian, your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Uh, This week, a public figure made a public appeal for a more private life. I thought it would be good to be rich and famous. It would be good to be the opposite of this. It would be good to have stuff. It would be good to have money. It would be good to be invited to the party. Well, I've been invited. I've been in. We're having this chat in a private Swiss members club in East London. It's super cool. There's bare brick walls. Everyone's double good looking. But I've been inside now. I've seen the other side of the looking glass. It's not good. Don't feed your soul. I still feel empty inside. The distinctive tones of Russell Brand there speaking at an event at Shoreditch House a couple of years ago. But he's not the celebrity that's in the headlines this week, Arian. No, 
Oh, well, he probably is in a different way. For something else. For something. (laughs) But we are talking about a different uh, celebrity. Which one? uh, Hong Kong rapper Jason Wang. I can't imagine why you didn't use a clip of him. Yeah. (laughs) I did actually look for one, but it turns out uh, I just couldn't find one that was in English. Anyway, he uh, he, uh, has sparked a debate on social media after breaking down during an interview uh, admitting that he no longer has the time to see his mum and dad with all of his various commitments, which include him being the uh, a member of this K-pop band GOT7. Uh, he's got a, his own solo career now, a bunch of endorsements that he does. He also hosts the Chinese version of Please Take Care of My Refrigerator, uh, which keeps him Pretty busy, I should imagine. I wasn't aware there was a non-Chinese version <laughs> of that. But anyway, okay, so a big star out there, big so a kind of Justin Timberlake of absolutely, the Furies, basically. Yeah, and had this moment where, uh, during a, uh, a chat show, uh, he broke down and, and said that he feels bad about the fact that he's not able to spend the time with his family that he'd like to, and it and it prompted this discussion on social media um, about whether the expectation that we should have of celebrities should be that they have engaged in a trade-off. You know, they have got the power and the celebrity and the money and the fame and all of that. Uh, and what they lose is their friends and family. And, and there were people taking quite sort of strong positions on both sides. I mean, whatever position you take, Felicity, it's quite useful, isn't it, for young people to see that debate happening? Because a lot of young people will say, what I most want to do is be famous Mm -hmm. and then think on a secondary basis for what without Mm -hmm. thinking about these kinds of implications. Yeah, but do we know he was being genuine? It might have been a ploy to get more sympathy and attention by making it look as though he's, you know, this super family guy and he's got the right values in the right place. But deep down, perhaps he had been, you know, told to put on this... Have you been chatting to Jamie Timpson about this? (laughs) It's a conspiracy. (laughs) I don't know. It's interesting, isn't it? I think there was another story about Scarlett Johansson saying that she's sort of warning that the paparazzi are getting back to their terrible old ways and that she thinks before long there'll be another Princess Diana um, type situation because they're sort of hounding these celebrities so much and this sort of call for, you know, celebrities privacy to to be respected. Yeah, exactly. That she was being chased after appearing on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And after she got out, she and her daughter, I think, were in a car and they were being pursued by the paparazzi in a way that she thought was pretty dangerous. And I think they had some hairy moments where they almost hit pedestrians. And she was sort of saying it's it's not just about my own safety, though I'm sure that was on her mind, but also the people around us. And, mm-hmm. and so, but I sort of think regardless of whether he was being sincere and genuine in his in that moment where he broke down. I think the debate is legitimate and and that question about whether celebrities should be you know should just suck it up and um, put up with the the intrusions or whether we should we should back off in our expectations of them. I think that's a really interesting question. Well, and for many years, that was the sort of Piers Morgan argument about phone hacking, wasn't it? Before the Daily Mirror actually ended up being implicated in phone hacking. But when he was talking about this publicly, he said, didn't he, Holden, you know, if, you, if you're if you a celebrity, you've chosen a certain lifestyle, you deserve mm. to be chased around. It's a trade-off. You know the deal. The British public possibly don't feel like that anymore because of things like phone hacking, I'd suspect. Yeah, and I wonder if social media has has played a part as well because it gives celebrities that direct access to their audience and so they can put their side of the story and that you know if if they have paparazzi chasing them they can post videos showing the, that sort of behavior. So I think it has redressed the balance. It hasn't though completely removed the demand for celebrity interviews, photographs, etc. So I think there is still that kind of culpability of people who are, you know, who, who go out and buy stuff or watch things online, who will create the demand for off-duty pictures or, or even for that, this kind of, you know, emotional availability of, of their stars. You make a fair point as well, Ali, that, you, that from the outside, you cannot know what fame is like. They're, you know, kids want it, not all kids, but lots of kids do probably. Uh, and, but you can't know what the experience is like until you until you finally have it. And at that stage, if you find you don't like it, it's kind of too late. You know, You've the genie no can't idea, be put back in the Marian. bottle. The times <laughs> I've been mobbed after covering drive time on BBC Radio Northampton just at the M1 <laughs> services. Seriously, I can't even use my Costa card without getting hassled. <laughs> well, you joke, but actually, you, you know, you do have a public profile. And I wonder whether, you know, you could 
give us some insight into whether the indignities that you say, is it worth it, Ollie Mayor? <laughs> Podcasting is a good way to achieve even the very F-level <laughs> of fame that I have because most people don't know what I look like and the people who do know what I look like know because they like my shows enough that they bothered to find a photo of me and commit it to memory. So therefore they come up to me when they do, which is about once a month, and say how much they love the show. That's a nice level of, it's more like recognition than fame, isn't it? And it could be the same as if, if I was in any industry. I suspect if I ran any business, there'd be a chance that that might happen. But I do think for people who, you know, particularly if they were on a reality show, for example, you know, not in a pop band like this guy, but actually are sort of famous for being famous, as we've seen recently with the spate of deaths associated with Love Island, there is obviously a pressure there. People know there's a pressure there, but it doesn't seem to stop the demand for people wanting to be famous. Mm, that's true. But I think what Arian was saying about being outside and looking in on like the the lives of the rich and famous, I think the rise of social media in recent years has a big part to play in that because I do think there's this feeling that we kind of own our celebrities and that it is this sort of feeling of ownership that we and they share with you know I was just thinking about Gwyneth Paltrow on Instagram this this um, debate that she shared a picture of her daughter Apple and Apple got really annoyed and told her mum to take it down this whole sharing thing mm. craze but the idea that the oh, more oh I've not heard that word <laughs> that's the did you not have you heard it before whole sharing thing we've all just learned sharing <laughs> but I'm learning so much <laughs> go on yeah but the idea that on the one hand celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow are quite happy to share you know candid family pictures and then the next minute say whoa you're sort of intruding on my privacy is is quite problematic and I suppose in some ways it does go back to Princess Diana's death and in so many ways that was a sort of watershed moment in British public life because a sort of overnight a very stiff upper lip public was suddenly wailing in the streets literally wailing in the streets over her and very much treating her as you know she was one of us she belonged to us we knew her this is I'm you know her death I might never have met her I might never have spoken to her but her death has affected me personally which was just unheard of in this country and I think there was this one image that I which always sort of stays with me was, was a sort of bystander in the crowd who who said to the Duke of Edinburgh you know make sure you look after the boys and he sort of responded in character he, I think he was quite irritated he was like well yeah obviously I'm gonna you know <laughs> you never but it was almost like this family grief had become a, a public thing and I think that's really interesting and I think social media has only exacerbated it to make it feel like these celebrities that belong to me they're part of my life now. and I sort of wonder whether you know uh, unlike the you know the Scarlett Johansson appeal where she's like well look can the paparazzi please stop chasing me down streets in their in their cars and on their mopeds it's hard to know what Jackson Wang was asking for or expects to happen because, you know, the, f what does well, that, he want? That'll be the because they're two completely separate stories, which you guys have conflated. Sure. <laughs> okay, so what Scarlett Hansen was asking for was a break from the paparazzi. Well, what he was doing was exhibiting having been a very under pressure pop star with a schedule that's completely exhausting, which happens, you know, that would be the same for One Direction, wouldn't it, at their peak? He, he's just saying, my job needs better work-life balance so I can see my parents. And you'd have to be a pop star for that to be the case. Well, it, that was the point I was going to make, actually. That, that Go it ahead. Seemed, it seemed what he was going through was essentially a public version of what quite a lot of other professions might demand of you. So if you joined up to the armed forces, for example, or even if you became a surgeon, you know, you may, may end up working long hours, you might have antisocial hours, you may not be able to see your family as much as you would have liked. And I don't really mean that as a criticism of him, more that this may actually be a, a positive for young fans to kind of see a version of the sort of thing that they may either be going through or may be going to go through. And just to, to be able to see that people who are in roles where previously they've had to pretend that everything is perfect about their lives. If you see that they actually suffer from a lot of the same sort of things, that might actually be a useful, useful lesson for young people. And you'd think that might actually equip them if they go into a life like being a pop star to say, OK, I've got the power in this position. I'm the famous one after a year or two. I'm going to ask for a work-life balance. I'm going to say I want Fridays off to see my dad. Has that worked for you, Ollie? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyone who was at our live show last week will know. <laughs> I, I have no free time because I'm mobbed by a legion of super fans <laughs> wherever we go, as was Holden. Absolutely. Yeah. Both of them were um, very keen to speak <laughs> to us. OK, one last story to come after this. And finally this week, it's Felicity. Uh, what do you think this week will be remembered for? What do we want, strong men? When do we want them? Now. <laughs> <laughs> This delay is a matter of great personal regret for me. And of this I am absolutely sure you, the public, have had enough. 
You're tired of the infighting. You're tired of the political games and the arcane procedural rows. Tired of MPs talking about nothing else but Brexit when you have real concerns about our children's schools, our national health service, knife crime. You want this stage of the Brexit process to be over and done with. I agree. I am on your side. Theresa May, our Prime Minister at the time of recording, uh, speaking this week. Uh, Felicity, this is a Brexit-free zone. What are you bringing this clip for? <laughs> so this was a, a headline in The Guardian that caught my eye, which was UK poised to embrace authoritarianism, warns the Hansard Society, which obviously caught my eye. Um, it's a study compiled annually by the Democracy Charity, um, who found a series of sort of worrying um, results um, when people were asked whether Britain needs a strong ruler willing to break the rules. 54% agreed and only 23% said no. Um, other findings, 42% of respondents agreed with the idea that many national problems could be dealt with more effectively if the government didn't have to worry so much about pesky votes in Parliament. I mean, is that just a natural response of the general public to the, um, <laughs> I was going to use a word that began with cluster there, but I'll say <laughs> to the um, um, uh, series of events that we find ourselves in? I think it is a response to where we are now, but I think I mean, that's... consensus is struggling, isn't it? Yeah, that's the point. Sure, Consensual sure. politics doesn't look good at the moment sure. because we can't find a consensus. But I don't think that's all it is. I, I slightly wonder whether authoritarian values have been there all along, and that's how we got into this mess in the first place. Because actually there was uh, another survey, um, all about the surveys today, um, in 2016, which was conducted by academics at the universities of Essex and Exeter, which found that as much as half of the adult population um, shared political worldviews that researchers would describe as authoritarian populist um, in favour of rolling back the state, negative about immigration, human rights and the EU, and which is you know, and then the referendum came along. So in some ways, I wonder actually how groundbreaking this, this study is. I wonder whether actually, when possibly this is scary, or, or a sort of uh, rise of authoritarianism has been there for absolutely years. Holden. I've also found some studies. Ooh, um, battling and studies. And these, the, these do suggest actually that the, there has been a significant shift over time in favour of authoritarianism um, in both Europe and the, the US. Uh, so less than a third of Americans born in the 80s think it's essential to live in democracy compared with three quarters of those who are born in the 30s. And uh, two years ago, just under a quarter of 16 to 24 year old Americans thought democracy was either bad or very bad. So it's not just a, a kind of passive drift away from democracy, but actually a, a kind of identification of a, of, of a negative quality to it. But again, I mean, history is possibly doomed to repeat itself, Arian, just because the most recent history is the history we all have in our minds. I mean, his, you know, democracy has brought us Brexit. Democracy has brought us Trump. So it's not necessarily people saying, oh, I've forgotten all about the Second World War and how terrible that was. It's just it's more recent in the memory that democracy isn't working for people. Yes, I think that's true. And also there's no shortage of authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, and I, I, this is an untested thesis and I have found no studies, um, I'm afraid. <laughs> but um, but I've, I've been wondering whether almost the rise of China has presented an alternative non-democratic model to, for a lot of people, that looks credible and and like a, a good potential alternative to democracy of a functioning society that can raise an enormous number of people out of poverty into middle class and wealth. And I wonder whether that's sort of impacted on people's thinking around the world, combined with the tolerance of your Donald Trump's and other world leaders of authoritarian regimes. You know, when Trump met Kim Jong-un recently, he said, I'm in love with him, you know, and he describes him as a good leader. So I wonder whether there's a sort of, there are other models being presented to people People that suddenly look like a, an okay alternative. I think as well, China's a very different bogeyman from the Soviet Union as well, and it seems to pose less of a direct threat in the way that you know people growing up between the end of the Second World War and the end of the 1980s had this looming threat of nuclear war invasion and the the, the very obvious. Um, spectacle of people being shot trying to climb over a wall to get into the democratic west and so it seemed very obvious if you had to choose between two 
systems, an authoritarian one and a democratic one, you would choose the democratic one. Hold on a minute. We are talking <laughs> about Britain here, Felicity. And I, I see why you bring this story. You look at the survey results. It is a bit distressing. You think, oh, this is exactly the recipe for fascism, basically. You know, the public are disappointed with politics as it is. They want a strong ruler. You know, consensus isn't working. But actually, because of our democratic system... Let's be honest. I mean, as extreme as it is realistically going to get is Boris Johnson on the right, who's already been a relatively consensual mayor of London, and Jeremy Corbyn on the left, who, despite being demonised by the right wing press, has been elected by the Labour Party and probably would be a fairly centrist prime minister in reality. So can't we just chill out about this? No. I I mean, I think that's a bit complacent because, but yeah, possibly, possibly it is an overblown survey. It's not wrong, though, is it? I mean, it might be complacent, it's not, but it's not going it's not, to get to the extreme. It's not wrong in the extent that that's where we are now, but we don't know where we could eventually get to. And I think you only have to look at sort of anti-Semitism in Labour, Islamophobia on in the Conservatives, fear of immigration, pushing away the EU to think that the kind of the seeds are there for something much worse, potentially. I think... Going back to the kind of global picture, you are seeing fewer military dictatorships, but you are seeing the rise of pseudo democracies where you have leaders who, uh, to all intents and purposes, seem as though they're adhering to democratic institutions. But actually, they're not really. And I think it is this kind of the allure and the attraction of the of an individual, you know, one powerful person like Trump or Bolsonaro or Viktor Orban or whoever, and it's them. We put all our power in them. And and that's scary because I think that really resonates with a lot of people. If we have the right person who is like the embodiment of what the people want, um, we can do away with all our democratic institutions. And I think that's definitely gaining ground. I think I think there probably is an element of that. And I, I looking through all of these studies in the round, I think there might actually be several different strands of reasoning that bring people to a, a questioning of democracy. And some of those are very definitely negative in the way that you outline. But I think there might be some positives too, in the sense that I think, you know, in the Cold War situation, there was a perhaps slightly lazy and self-congratulatory way of thinking democracy is good, it's an end in itself, as long as you're a democracy, you can kind of give yourself a pat on the back. And now the the absence of that opposition has created a bit more space for self-criticism and wondering, like, is democracy working for everybody who lives under it? How might it be made to work better? I would say that they're, they're not necessarily asking how can we make democracy better? They're saying, what's the alternative to democracy? And if they land on authoritarianism, surely that's not a positive. My thesis is that some of people are saying, let's go for authoritarianism, said, but some people buried in these figures may not be. So there was a European study um, a couple of years ago asking people to rank uh, values in order of importance. And it, the, the headline was that democracy was very low down that list. But actually, some of the things that came above it were human rights, peace, security, tolerance, freedom, prosperity. And so, you know, you could interpret that as saying, well, we, we kind of take democracy for granted, but we want to we want to find a form of democracy that actually allows us to, to, to drill down into what that means a little bit more. And that, you know, democracy could be seen as a way of asserting the rights of the majority over a minority. And perhaps for younger people, looking at looking at some of those shortfalls and how they're addressed within a democratic system might be might be what they're looking for, rather than necessarily looking for a, a British dictator. <laughs> but the question that they were actually asked by the Hansard Society is, Britain needs a strong ruler willing to break the rules, agree or disagree. I mean, that's a loaded question, isn't it? If If half the people answering really just meant... Britain needs a strong leader like Margaret Thatcher or Tony Blair, and that's looking like a halcyon time now because we're in such chaos. That doesn't mean they have to break the rules. It's in the question that they do. I think you're right, and I think that they've they've put a bunch of parts into the one question that seem logically to follow, but if you were to break them out, one wonders whether people might have said yes to the first part and no to the second part. One of the questions was, could national problems be dealt with more effectively if the government didn't have to worry so much about votes in parliament? That seems like a question that the answer now is going to be very different from what it might have been six months ago, because we've had a series of votes in parliament that have made life very difficult for the government. And you don't really have to be an authoritarian to think that. I think you'd you'd have to have quite a 
blinkered view to look at the current situation and not say that's a statement of fact, regardless of whether you want to or not. That's the end of the show. <laughs> my show, my rules. None of this consensus. That is it from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Holden Frith, Felicity Capon and Arian McNichol. Uh, if you, like a strong leader who can keep his people in line, you will love our back catalogue. Discover it when you subscribe to The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice. And don't forget our little Venn diagram. You get six issues for a pound and a free moleskin notebook branded with the week when you go to theweek.co.uk slash offer and enter the promo code podcast. I've been Ollie Mann, the great leader. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again, to unwrap next week. Bye-bye.